Welcome back to Star Talk. Um, oh, sorry, wrong show. Um, welcome to December's Astro Talk. Uh, this month we're going to hear four talks from four different section directors of the ASV covering four different areas of astronomy and what they have to offer the members and potential members of the society. First up, we'll have a talk from Ken Lamarkland on lone telescopes. Don't read what I wrote there because it doesn't say loan. Um, <laughs> the second talk will be from Kevin Orman Rossiter on solar astronomy section, followed by Stuart Beveridge covering lunar and planetary section, and rounding it out with Phil Costigan giving us a talk on the radio astronomy section and sharing with us uh, what each of those sections has to offer us. Uh, following the talks, we'll be announcing the winners of the CJ Murfield Members Award and the CJ Murfield Astrophotography Award, so stick around for those. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to say in the, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Um, now, before we do kick off the talks, I just wanted to also let you know that we've got just over a week left in the um, Christmas. It's beginning to feel a lot like Christmas, Raffin. Still tickets available. Um, we've raised some good money for our remote observatory project that's coming up, so that's good. Um, so you can still get those tickets and they'll be drawn on next Friday night's gazing, uh, a, a very, where's that? I can't even think of what the stream was called now. <laughs> gazing at the Galaxies of Christmas Special, that was it, uh, which will be next Friday evening and we'll be drawing the raffle then. So you've still got time to grab tickets. Now, first up is Ken. Ken, if you'd like to come and take the stage, or we'll just we'll apologise for the little bit of fiddling that's going to occur at the moment while Ken gets himself set up. You can talk while you do that. I can talk up to men if you want. I was, I was going to say I... I learned to do two things at once by chewing gum and using my yo-yo at the same time. Um, okay. Um, so for those that don't know me, my name's Ken Lee Marklin. I run the New Astronomer Group, um, but I also um, take on lone telescopes. Um, lone telescopes. Um, so I took on lone telescopes to try to pull them both together. Here we go. Of course I want to set that up now. <sighs> Come on. Here we go. Hopefully we're there. So I'm going to talk about lone telescopes tonight. Here we go. I think we're going now. Um, so lone telescopes is a scheme... Uh, started over 20 years ago, um, and we loan out a telescope to members for a period of three months. So three months gives you a really good um, period to get out with it at least a few nights, hopefully more. Um, also, the possibility of getting away to a dark sky um, to use the telescope because it's nice and small and fits in just about any car. There's, uh, uh, in the past, there's been talk about, oh, well, why don't we do a 10-inch scope or a 12-inch scope? Well, they need to be portable and easy to move. So um, when we got hit by COVID, we only had eight telescopes and every time we had to cancel the loaning of telescopes, the queue just got longer and longer. So we now have 14 telescopes and four of those telescopes were donated by members and one person from the public, just a random, heard about the ASV, donated a telescope. So 14 telescopes fills the club rooms at the ASV Lodge, so they don't all fit in, but the other side of the room also full of lone telescopes. This is at a swap over afternoon where we have the telescopes come in, 
um, around midday and people pick up around 3.30. So we have one spare, so that makes 15. And we have one really old telescope that was used at club nights, which is an old F5 version. Um, so the theme here is what is next for the Lone Telescope Scheme. Well, one of my helpers, when we went to 14 um, telescopes, I had to get another helper and I had five people put their hand up. So I decided, well, let's get two extras. So we now have three helpers. And one of them wanted to um, do something else for the members because the feedback from about half our members, how did the telescope go? Well, it was really hard finding things. I don't know where to look, didn't know how to point it properly. Um, so one of our members, Jim, which is one of my helpers, he asked me if he could attach some setting circles. Now, this is nothing new. They've been around for a long, long time. But I guess what is new these days is you can have an app on your phone and you can look it up and it'll give you the altitude and um, right ascension coordinates. So what you can do is pick a bright star, um, get that in the centre of view, set your setting circles to um, the altitude and longitude that your phone is telling you that star is at. Um, and then you can take off around the sky using the altitude um, and an inclinometer, which is this guy up here, um, to start finding other objects. So if they can learn just a few bright stars, they can then start using these to dial objects in. So um, this is our first attempt to try to help out members. So Jim made up a prototype. So this is the prototype. Hence, we've got straps and things and, and clamps over here holding things on. They're just temporary. Um, but now this has gone out to an ASV member for evaluation. So he's got a sheet on how to use it. And we're eagerly going to await to see how he goes um, with the setup. We took it to instrument making section as well. Um, they were really um, keen on this idea and they've offered a few suggestions um, that we're gonna take on board when, when we sort out this, get it right, get it working, then we'll probably put a proposal forward to um, council, looking at you, Mark, um, to maybe do this for more telescopes or all the telescopes. But I think we keep it small, get it working correct, um, and see how it goes. Um, of course, some people are going to have difficulty trying to use setting circles, but they don't have to use the setting circles. They're there for people that want it, and I think that's, that's what we're going to do. So... We're waiting for that feedback. Here's a little close-up of the inclinometer. It just um, tells you the angle that the tube is pointing at. Um, so we've had some suggestions from instrument making section about some 3D printing. Don't go that way. Um, 3D printing that when we roll this out, it'll just make things easier and cheaper to do. Um, I'd also be interested to hear from any members. So if there's someone in the audience with a suggestion or come and talk to me later, or if people are listening, you can send me an um, email to lonetelescopes at asv.org.au. Um, ideas about maybe you've done this, you've got ideas. So, yeah, we'll see where this goes. Um, We'll work it out first before we roll it out to all the others. Um, so we have this other telescope. It was one of, there was a bunch of these telescopes that got auctioned off to ASV members. Um, you may remember that a few years ago, but this one was kept for club and now a 10-inch Dobsonian turned up, so they use that. 
So this is smaller. So um, I think I used the wrong word. This could be a great kids size telescope. I think kid friendly telescope because it's a bit smaller. Or we could make it into an ultra portable one that maybe collapses down and you can take it away. So offer something different in the scheme. Or maybe it's something that will do both. So we're taking on some new ideas this year. We'll see how that goes. Um, and one of the long-term um, things to work on will be to look at what other types of scopes ASB members might be interested in and what other types of scopes maybe members might donate towards the scheme. Because um, the cheaper we can keep it, the lower the price will be to borrow it. So that's Lone Telescopes. I've also set up a, um, a chat group for the new astronomers group. So groups IO, if you know that. I think a few sections are using that. Um, and I'm directing my Lone Telescope people to join that. So when they get questions about their Lone Telescopes, they can put it in and other people will respond. Something's about to come out in crux saying we need some more people to, to get the chat going. We, we just have low numbers. So thank you, everybody. And that's me done. Short, short and sweet. We like those ones. So that telescope, can you bring that one back up again? Because I'm going to ask you a question about it. What, what are you, were you looking at loaning that out to kids? Is that what we're talking about? That one specifically for, for youth? Yeah, maybe we make it a smaller one that's yep. more suited to kids. For, for the junior section, for instance. That, yeah. That, so if there's be. a junior that might want to use it, we could get it to them. Yeah, so we're open to all suggestions on this. That one's upside down. There we go. Yeah. Um, so it's a, a metre instead of 1.2. Yep. So we could make it more compact. We could put it lower to the ground. Or we could change the tube so it breaks into two pieces to fit in a car. I'm open to suggestions, really. I'm just, you know. I, like the, yeah. I like the idea of breaking it up as well. Yeah. yeah. Portability for families. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, you know, two pieces that go together, not 16 knots to do one. But you know, <laughs> we, can, we can shoot through that with the instrument. Paper. Well, there you go. If you've got any ideas, throw, yeah. throw them at Ken. Absolutely. Any questions in the crowd? No? No? No questions for you? Now, Kevin from Solar Section is going to come up and try and get his slideshow going. Am I allowed to make the announcement for you, Russell? Is that no? All right. I don't know. I'm just asking questions on the fly. What are we talking about in solar? What are we covering? The section and sun. I the section and the sun. Well, the, the sun might be a bit more. Yeah. Like yeah. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? We need elevated music while it loads, hey? No, get rid of that. We don't want that. There we go. Microphone for you. Take it away. Thank you. Don't fall off the stage, though. I will try not to fall off the stage, Joe. Um, good evening. Those of you who don't know me, my name's Kevin, Kevin Orman Rossiter. I'm the new, solar, new director of the solar section. Um, I thought I'd put up a picture of the sun because I know over the last few months we really haven't seen much of it. But that's actually what we're trying to study in the solar section. Um, and how do we... Oops, oh, good. So what are we about? We're actually about viewing the sun in a safe manner, um, viewing it and photographing it whenever possible. Um, the thing about the sun is that, unlike lots of things, I always, I always love listening to other astronomers who go, well, I took these pictures 10 years ago, and I put these ones together with the ones I took last month. And the solar guys, we all go, oh, half an hour ago, the sun looked like this, and an hour later, it's going to look like this, and next week, it'll look completely different. So we're actually interested in following, analysing, you know, trying to understand what the sun does in the dynamics. So it's our nearest star. 
And usually what we do is um, view it in a whole lot of different lights. So I've actually put them up there. There's the greenish looking one is actually white light. It's got a green continuum filter on it. Um, also in hydrogen alpha and the purplish looking one over on the right hand side is calcium K. So we're actually look at the sun in a whole lot of different lights, but the dynamics of it. So, so you know, the typical solar section person gets enthused and starts mumbling about sunspot numbers and um, what are they doing in the active regions, starts mumbling about plagias and faculi and um, granulation and pores and flares and prominences and filaments and all those features we can actually see there. So we're actually really quite keen on understanding what the sun's doing at the moment what it's been doing and trying to track it because it has a whole lot of, I mean, any, any, everybody who sort of has done some astronomy goes, oh, it's the solar cycles. We know there's 11 years of this and 22 years of this, but the sun changes on a daily, hourly basis. So one of the interesting things we do differently is actually follow the sun and the dynamics and try and compare that to what we were seeing it a little while ago. And of course, like any good astronomers, we'll sit there and talk your legs off a chair about the equipment we've got and the cameras and the what sort of scope we've got and all those sort of fun things. So, but the, the important point is the safe bit, which Russell, myself, anybody who's giving demonstrations on solar viewing starts talking about safety first because it's the only bit of astronomy that's quite dangerous if you just look directly at the object, unlike everything else. You might go, that's really obvious, Kevin, but it's something we always have got to caution when we're doing public viewings or anything else like that, that you've got to look at it safely. And so talking about the equipment is actually quite important when we start doing solar observing. Oh, just gonna... But there's actually more to solar observation than just looking at calcium 2K light and hydrogen alpha light and, and white lights of, um, of the sun. There's also things that we're actually looking at the sun's doing because it's not just sitting up there as a, as a um, even though it's dynamic, it's not just sitting up there as a, you know, an object that, that doesn't interfere with what we're doing. So we actually get excited about the sensations of a solar eclipse. So lunar eclipses, we'll leave them to the lunar guys, but the solar eclipses, people here and people of the solar section will travel all over the world to catch a solar eclipses. The next one's early next year in 2023, yes, it's still next year, and there will be tra people travelling to the most westerly point of Exmouth in Western Australia to try and catch that only bit of the total solar eclipse that Australia is going to see. So one of the things that solar members get excited about is solar eclipses. The other thing is just things that the sun does, auroras. Um, anybody who's travelled to the northern and seen the northern lights or has been able to see the southern lights, sometimes we even get them here in Victoria. That's part of our solar um, viewing, part of the excitement of, of being a solar observer. Um, other things that we get excited about, transits, which unfortunately the last transit of Venus was a little while ago, so if you missed that, that's what a transit looks like on the far, far upper right-hand side. Um, the next one, sadly, is 2117, so I'm probably going to just miss it. I think I'll be um, just a little bit old by that stage, but Mercury is coming up in 2032, so uh, solar section will be tracking the Mercury transit, and um, hopefully we'll be able to go live because it's actually viewable late in the afternoon here in Melbourne, so we'll be able to track most of Mercury transiting across the sun. We also get excited about, you know, magnetic fields, coronal holes, and the ever-changing space weather. So the sun, not only being dynamic, it impacts on our our um, environment here on the Earth. So solar section members get excited about what's the space weather, what's the solar wind doing, what what are we actually seeing? Um, and if I can actually mention one important bit about solar observing, we do it during the day. How good is that? Bloody astronomy during the day. It's very good. I get to um, then enjoy the port while everyone else is trying to set up their scopes, um, get to annoy people with the general things, and um, every now and again do my own lunar and planetary observing. But yes, solar observing is during the day. And that means um, one of the things we are, we do, and Russ is always the previous director has pioneered this, doing it well, which is we're the opening gig at all that LMDSS um, public viewings. We're 
up there solar viewing, showing off our, the scope and showing the sun to the public before everyone gets set up during the night. So I actually find that quite good, where the, the opening gig for the, for the bigger um, bands when they come on later at night. But that's an important part of it. What else do we've got? We've got Facebook pages. We've got, um, we run our monthly sessions and quite often that's an observing session where we'll have two, one, two, maybe even three different people showing live the sun as we're going through in different lights. So Facebook page where people can put things up and share their, their observations, whether they are photographs or drawings or anything of the sun or what's going on in the magnetic fields. What auroras did they see? What transits have they seen? What um, uh, um, where are we? Solar eclipses have they visited? And we also have a lone hydrogen alpha scope, which um, is not the one that's in viewing there, but it's a smaller one, which is actually great for getting to know what the sun looks like, drawing it, getting used to it. So that's also part of our program we offer anybody who's interested in solar astronomy. Um, and if you're interested in any of these things, the solar section's for you. Come along, talk to me, catch, up at, catch us up at any of the LMDSS public events, but also get onto the Facebook page and um, talk solar. So I've kept mine short and sweet as well. You have. Very short and sweet. Very, very good. <laughs> so how old will you be in 2117? <laughs> Now, huh? I'll be like yeah, 130. Yeah. Old, old, I'll be, yeah, just a little bit old. I'll probably have grey hair. Just? Just. I'll yeah. be 131 and still have a rainbow mohawk. Now, our next talk is Stuart from the Lunar and Planetary section. And while Stuart sets up, because we don't have elevator music, I'll just show off our lovely 100th year anniversary old oak tawny port, which you can still buy online. Um, and we also have some here available if you haven't bought any uh, with our lovely 100 year anniversary logo on it. And this beast of a bottle, etched glass with our logo in it, which is a, a tawny liqueur. Is that right, Gavin? Where is he hiding? Yeah. Liqueur port, a tawny port liqueur. It looks beautiful. That's coming home with me. Uh, that's still available online as well. The, this, the standard bottles are $30 uh, and the liqueur ones, are, with the etch glass, they're $70. There's only four of those left, but if we, order, if we sell enough, we'll, go, we'll order another batch. So, um, and before we get going, Stuart, just quickly on the, the, the port, for those who have bought their port, you can pick it up at the lodge on this Saturday between one o'clock and three o'clock. Oh, yours, Stuart. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? <clears throat> well, well, welcome everyone. My name's Stuart Beveridge and I run the uh, Lunar and Planetary section. And um, the meetings occur every third Friday from 8 p.m. Uh, in person and by Zoom, excluding December and January months. And this is um, uh, an image that I've got up there from one of our members, uh, regulars, George Schwab. I think I've gone too far now. Okay. So um, what I do is I, I try and break the meeting up into four parts um, because, um, and I'll tell you when I get to part four. So part one is a lunar and planetary facts session. Uh, part two is usually a presentation by a member or by myself on a chosen topic for the month. Um, part three is planets in the sky for the month um, by Stellarium. And part four is images sent in to me by ASV members. And uh, because the, the discussions about them, the images can go on, drag on for a while. I'll put that last so that people who aren't necessarily interested in imaging can drop off and go and do something else. So uh, some of the topics recently covered um, in part one is uh, uh, all the planets have now been summarized and described 
and uh, all the dwarf planets have also been summarized and described, including Pluto. Um, and then last month in November, I covered the, uh, the moon. And uh, out of that, um, my plan for 2023 is to reinitiate the Lunar 100, which is similar to um, uh, the uh, Messier 100, but done on the moon. And uh, someone asked me, can I just take an image of the full moon and break it up into 100 parts? Well, it doesn't actually work quite that easily because you can't see some of the objects um, like the straight wall, pretty hard to see unless it's at first quarter, et cetera, et cetera. But Arthur Coombs did this some years back with help from another member who I can't remember his name and uh, covered them all off. Um, part two, um, some of the presentations we've had in part two is capturing the colours of the outer planets by Con Colivus, uh, false colour imaging by Barry Adcock, uh, tilted component telescopes by myself and Barry Adcock. And um, we will cover latest information on space uh, missions related to lunar and planetary. And just recently, the James Webb Space Telescope solar images, which included Neptune and Jupiter's rings. And uh, looking at surface features of Titan, because it can see through the atmosphere being an uh, infrared telescope. And some of the uh, images submitted by members, uh, this, uh, you can see there that Russell's uh, sent in his lunar um, images from the, uh, from the lunar eclipse. And Andrew, that's one of his Saturn images where you can actually see up to about four moons. Uh, Barry Adcock and his multispectral uh, image strips, which I'll uh, return to on my last slide and Cliff Ashcraft. Cliff is an international member from New Jersey and a good friend of mine, and he sends in uh, a lot of images of uh, various planets, and it's pretty handy when, we, um, when he can see them up overhead, which is gonna happen to Jupiter in the next couple of years, and we're gonna be um, struggling to see some of these planets, including Mars. Um, That's one of Con's um, images up there of Saturn and George. Now, talking about the lone telescopes, uh, lone telescopes are a Dobsonian and not driven, and so they won't track uh, the sky automatically. But George, who did this image down on the bottom right, has written an article on the, using the drift method to do um, lunar and planetary photography. So if anyone's interested, um, you're more than welcome to email me for a copy. Um, and then John Castanis, he uh, wasn't able to do too many images of Jupiter this year, and neither was anyone really because of the weather. And another there, one there from Kevin Burford. Um, Carol, yeah, and, and Mark Justice. So just talking about Mark's, this is, um, normally we use high-speed video cameras and we use a technique known as lucky imaging. This image by Mark was actually done on his phone. So um, pretty impressive result really uh, for a phone camera. And he's even got the colors pretty close to what uh, Mark Justice has, uh, has got on his image. Then Peter and Claire Avril, they send in a lot of images through their little six inch telescope. So you don't need a really big telescope to send in great uh, take great images. Uh, Stefan Buddha, uh, his uh, Ju Jupiter image. Uh, that's one of my Jupiters and uh, Vince um, Laschiavo. And um, also I like to um, uh, remind people that we've got this very handy page in the, in the yearbook showing the rise and set times of all planets uh, for the year so that you can plan all your observing sessions. Uh, the other program that I, I was, um, mentioned before, Stellarium, uh, I like to use Stellarium. It's quite easy to use. It's free, although not on a uh, Android device, and I'm not sure about Apple, uh, whether it's free, but it's not doesn't cost very much, but you can just download it onto your laptop or uh, your home computer, and uh, it's quite a helpful tool. And just to finish off, 
speaking, getting back to what Barry Adcock's been doing with his um, uh, imaging, um, this is an announcement that just came out in the last couple of weeks from the British Astronomical Association talking about a webinar that's coming up in um, on a Wednesday, 2023, March the 1st, starting at 1900 Universal Time, which will be, I believe, March the 2nd, about 6 a.m. Is that about right, Barry? Um, so uh, I'll just read it out. The multispectral imaging uh, for analysis of Jupiter's atmosphere. Many amateur observers take beautiful images showing the colours and methane absorption of Jupiter's multi-layered atmosphere, but the conclusions have been little more than descriptive until now. Four international observers have recently developed careful calibrated procedures for making and analysing these images and will describe them in this webinar. So the, the webinar will open with John Rogers, who's the section director of the Jupiter part of the BAA, followed by Christopher Pellier, Stephen Hill, Antonio and Barry Adcock. So um, congratulations on getting into that webinar, Barry. And as soon as I get the information um, on where or how you can actually look at the webinar, I'll put it out on the Lunar and Planetary Facebook page and also on Crux Extra. And that's just about all I have to say. Does uh, anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> we do have one. Stuart, I noticed that Mercury wasn't mentioned being a, uh, a difficult object, uh, the planet Mercury. Has it, does anyone in the section uh, do Mercury observing or photography? Well, we, we do when we can see it, but as, yes. as you say, it doesn't get very uh, yes. high above the horizon, yep. and either the east or the west. So um, I've only actually really honestly only seen it once when we did a, um, a sky for the people down at St Kilda Beach. Right. Um, yep. Other than that, I, can't, I can honestly say that I can't really confirm any other Im, Im, any other time I've imaged or seen mm. Mercury. But uh, no, no, not, not many people right. image it because Very of its tough. difficulty factor. Yeah. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Russell. Any other questions? No? Good? Sorry for sneaking up on you like that, Stuart. That's all right. Now, uh, our next talk will be from our... Uh, Infamous radio astronomy section director, <laughs> Phil Costigan. Come on up, Phil. Phil's going to get his, his slideshow ready. While Phil does that, I'll, um, I'll just let everybody know that there are some very large novelty checks that will be handed out later on to our CJ Murfield winners. The trophies are being made at the moment, so we don't have the trophies with us this evening, but they will be, be available uh, hopefully early in the new year, probably early, sort of mid-January. Uh, so once Russell's finished his, we'll get into presenting the awards. So not Russell. Russell's not talking tonight, is he? Phil. Or is it Mitch? Take it away, Phil. Okay, so I'm not going to talk all about what we do because I'd be here for the rest of the night and tomorrow and the next day and the next because radio astronomy does cover a lot of subjects. But what I will talk about is something that may actually affect our future with uh, the radio astronomy section um, with an event that occurred just before the Christmas star party that we had earlier this year. Uh, at 9am before the Christmas star party on the 26th of November, the radio astronomy section had a meeting at the Drake's Lounge, which is actually with SARA, which is the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, which is based in the USA. The, before the meeting began, and I should probably point out that um, a new of ours, uh, Mr. Paul Butler, helped organise this. He's a member of the uh, SARA group, uh, he's with our group, the um, radio astronomy section. Paul organised the meeting and as a part of it he suggested that we should 
include some of the other radio astronomers from Australia. So he got on to um, Andrew Klekluke. I can barely pronounce his surname. That's the guy in Tasmania with the Astronomical Society of Tasmania. He got in touch with Roger Heap from the Astronomical Society of New South Wales, another radio astronomer. Blair Larder from South Australia, ASA. And uh, before the meeting got recorded or started proper, we were starting to have our own little meeting and saying, hey, we should all get together and do things. So it's, uh, it was a good idea just to uh, get us all together. So the meeting started off and uh, this chap here, no, not those. Uh, how do you go back? I've got a helper. <laughs> Go back one. This guy here, Rich Russell, is the president of SARA. He um, introduced us all. He organised at his end people from all over America and also a chap from Germany who are in this group. And uh, the idea was to form a, uh, an alliance, I suppose, from the southern hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere. This group of guys that you're about to see that you probably already just saw is us. The radio astronomy crew that turned up in the morning at 9am at LMRO. Um, oh, we've got some video as well. So I had, didn't organise that. So we had uh, Stephen Bentley. Um, we had... Mitch Rate, Lee Green, who's running the show now. That's Paul Butler there. Um, myself. And um, we basically set up a nice big speaker so that everyone in the uh, LMDSS could hear us. And we had one visitor. That visitor happened to be Ian Somerville, who was walking past and said, this is very interesting. I'll have a sit here. And he joined us which is what the intention was for anybody who was in the area to come along and have a listen. Now, Sarah, in my mind, when I first heard about the group, I was thinking, all oh, these guys are going to be all highfalutin, nickel, big dishes and arrays and all whatnot. But no, they're a group of people just like us. This chap here, Pablo Lua, he's got a two-metre dish in his backyard and he sets it up and he runs all the same sort of software that we've been using at LMRO. And that's the sort of people that are in their group. There was, they also do have, though, um, at the other end of the spectrum, people who have got 25-metre dishes and great big arrays and all sorts of things. So they've got an, a gamut of different people all trying to do things with their radio astronomy equipment and they all have the same troubles that we had up at LMRO. They have power issues, they have rust problems, they're building things, they're struggling and they all communicate with, with one another, helping one another out and they're after ideas from us and they'll give us help for things that we're having trouble with and that's Really fantastic. This guy, Wolfgang Hermann, is in Germany. This here is a map that one of the guys in America has put together. Have a guess what this white area is. Has anyone got an idea? That there is the southern hemisphere. And he hasn't got a picture of that. We've got the ability to be able to fill in that white gap and get him the full map of the sky. And we know that we can do that because earlier in this year, Stephen Bentley, with the help of a few others, managed to map Crux, Norma, and uh, I've forgotten, there was another part of the sky I've forgotten the name of. And you've probably seen some of that right up in Crux, is that? coming out this month I think it'll be coming out this month you'll see all that right up so he's only we've only done a small section of the sky but we know we can do it now and that's really exciting 
and we'll be able to help this guy fill in his hole. <laughs> That pretty much concludes my little uh, talk on that of the future for the radio astronomy section, being able to join the rest of the world. And I hope you can join us one day and have a look. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Phil about this wonderful, um, well, it's like an expansion really. Uh, we've we've always had international members, but this is sort of taking it above and beyond, isn't it? Yes, we do have um, members in the group that are from Alaska and the like, which are people who are doing the job, the task that very similar setups to what we have in um, Leomir Radio Observatory. Um, but this will give us a much larger gamut of uh, information and help and we hopefully can help them as much as they can help us. So, yeah, it is. It's, it's great. It's great to hear. Um, so if you're not into or if you haven't gone to one of the radio astronomy section meetings, I, I go to a couple of them and they're wonderful. I have no idea what you guys talk about. Yeah, that's why I didn't go straight over the radio. head. <laughs> but it's still interesting and it's great to see international collaboration um, within the ASV uh, on projects. That's for sure. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Well, uh, well, so the solar guys do it in the day and the, the starry guys do it at night. And us guys have, the, what do you call it when you just don't get any sleep? <laughs> Insomnia. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. And do you, need, do you need clear skies? So, no, you don't need clear skies for radio astronomy, except there is one thing that really annoys us, and that's lightning storms going over and causing a lot of noise on the radios. But 24-7 is uh, radio astronomy. So, yeah, it's a lot of automation to, to be done to make that easier. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is at the moment, message to astrophotographers and deep sky visual observers and even lunar and planetary guys, and at the moment, solar as well, join radio astronomy because there while is, it's cloudy for all of us right now, it's not for them. For the solar guys, there are some experiments that we run yeah. that are monitoring the solar events and so there's a so collaboration probably, yeah. there's a collaborative project you can do and you could probably do one with the lunar and planetary as well couldn't you with with jove and no, also we do uh, detect radio emissions from jupiter and what about the moon can we do anything uh, with the moon we hope one day to possibly do what's called eme or earth moon earth where we transmit reflect off the moon and see the Doppler effect of that transmission. So there's that, that's, that's future stuff at this point. So there's opportunity for collaboration, not only internationally, but within our own sections. I can see somebody's got their hand up. Now, Phil, do we have to travel to uh, LMDSS to, the, to do, uh, use the equipment? No, it's all, we haven't got it quite set up properly with the internet stuff yet, and we're pushing to try and get that sorted. But the data is being streamed, if you like, and stored in a location so that we can go to the web page, go to the data, and you can draw data from that web page. That's the full goal. We haven't quite got there yet, but no, you don't have to come down. But it's, I, I actually, like going up to see the dish and all the equipment it's, <laughs> it's something nostalgic about that i suppose but yeah this sort of thing is really exciting i like seeing the cricket stumps move around when the dish moves yeah, the veils have been knocked off so who's been bowling it oh. <laughs> yeah i'm here for the photo scott boland probably yeah, possibly all right yeah. well thank you very much phil thank you to all of You're our right. thank you speakers tonight um just also wanted to, to congratulate Barry on uh, his talk in March that he's going to be giving. That's uh, wonderful news, Barry. What we'll do is when you get that link, um, Stuart, we'll just share it on the public Facebook page as well, just in case there's anybody who's interested in, in watching it as well. well. We'll make Barry really nervous when he has a million people watching him give his talk. All right. It's now time for... 
um, the CJ Murfield Awards. We might need a little bit of light in here, Lee, but not too much. Oh, he can't reach. Okay. But so what I'm going to do is I need to ask someone up here to uh, announce the first winner. And then Steve, if you can come up and give us a hand with this, that'd be great. Don't knock the. Yep. Cool. Um, I'll hand you this microphone. And I'm going to have to play photographer. Oh, he's got a speech and everything. Oh, this is great. All right. So do I need? Do you want me to announce the name first, or would you? You can do it. I'm going to hand this over to Steve, and Steve's going to announce our members award. So, basically, this was an award that we created to um, acknowledge the work, the tireless work that some of our members do as volunteers behind the scenes. And we had quite a few nominations. Um, and committee deliberated over and then voted on who they thought was um, the most, the one that deserved it the most, I guess. Yeah, um, I can. Uh, and so, I'm going to hand it over to you now, or yours. So this is called the CJ Murfield Member Award for 2022. Um, I've got a few notes here because there's, there's a few things that it covers. Um, so just read, this prize is awarded to an individual who has been nominated by other members for making a particularly noteworthy contribution to the ASV in one or more of the following areas. And there's three areas, uh, and I think uh, you'll agree when we get to the end of this that the person who's won the award actually uh, has performed noteworthy contributions in all of those areas. So the three are exceptional work in the field of volunteering for the society. Second one is promoting the society in a positive, uplifting, and supportive manner. And the third one is contributing to the growth and betterment of, of the society. So I'm actually really pleased that Mark asked me to come up and uh, uh, present this award, um, because the person who uh, is the winner of the award, I've known them since I joined the society back in 2007, 15 years ago, and um, we've become very good friends over that time. And the person already knows who it is, of course. So. <laughs> Looking a bit uh, embarrassed too. <laughs> so just a little bit of history of, of, um, of the person. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, well, her involvement anyway with council and the committee. So she started back as an ASV councillor, and I can't, it's, it's quite a few years ago, I think now. And initially she was looking after the ASV event schedule and the, cal the calendar as well. She's currently the public relations and social media officer, so it's a giveaway now. Uh, and if that's not enough, uh, she's also recently taken on board the membership secretary role. Part-time, part not, not forever. Oh, part-time, yeah. yeah. Caretaking, I Caretaking. think is the word. Yeah. Yes, caretaking. She'll tell us off if we say it's permanent. Something else as well is that she's also sets a fantastic example for women to get actively involved uh, in the society. And fairly recently, she set up a Women in the ASV community group, which... Uh, I know just talking to her this evening seems to be growing quite rapidly, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, 52 members already, I think, on, on that community group. So she works tirelessly, tirelessly um, uh, on all of the things that she gets involved in. Um, and it's a lot, whether it's preparing the, the funny and interesting posts that she puts out on the social media platforms that we have, whether she's responding to queries from the public about the ASV and whether they want to join or, or just know a little bit more about the ASV, organizing our star parties. You may have seen her at the star barbecue as Santa's little helper. Um, uh, or helping out at public events uh, and activities. And she's helped me a lot with, in my role as the coordinator of the Astronomy for the People section. So um, 
I'm really, really pleased to announce that the winner of the CJ Murfield Member Award for 2022 is Linda Richmond. Congratulations, Linda. You have to come up and get your novelty check. Come on. Um, did you did you talk about how she um, is on the events team as well, and she's responsible for the entire events calendar and organising it and putting up with my crap as well? Um, she really does do an amazing job. She keeps us in order. She keeps all of us in line. Mama Linda, that's that's it. Yes. Yep. Now this is yours. Your novelty check. I had a bit of fun today. Can you tell? Are you going to stand next to Steve? We're going to get a photo. No, no, stand, you can stand. He's nervous. There we go. Beautiful. Congratulations, Linda. Would you like to say a few words? No? Thank you. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Now, we have some photography awards to hand out as well. Oh, I hope I haven't lost you. No, I haven't lost it. And it's all right, it's here. Now it's me fluffing around trying to get things working. USB, Lee, always goes in the wrong way, then the wrong way, then the right way. Three, three times round, that's the way it works. Three times round. Ah, oh, there's a problem with the drive. Ken... Ignore it. There we go. It's, it's fine now. It's fine. All right. So we have four images. This is our ASV Junior image. Most votes by an ASV Junior entrant. Nathan Scott, congratulations. Come on up. <laughs> oh. You have a novelty check as well. That's for you. Congratulations. Hold it around. There we go. We stand next to that. I'm going to get a photo of that. Sorry to embarrass you like that, but it's a cracking shot. No, we get it. We can get it all in. Stand up. It's all good. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's better. I'll edit those later. Congratulations. Now. Do you, want to, do, do you want to say a few words or you, you want to have a chat or, yeah? There you go. Learn Picks Inside. It really helps. On, on that note, I need some lessons because I don't know how to use it. Congratulations, Nathan. That's um, an amazing image of Tarantula Nebula. Now, that was taken at the Dark Sky site, wasn't it? Yeah. So you don't have to be um, old to take images of the night sky like most of us are. You can be a young buck if you want to. Now, our next one. Oh, Linda's going to have to come back up again. Sorry, Linda. Linda didn't do this photo. This is Rusty McGrath's nightscape image. Absolutely stunning. Rusty can't be with us tonight, so he dobbed Linda in to come and collect it, which I'm glad he did because it meant I didn't have to try and convince her to come up to get her award. Here we go. Another novelty check. <laughs> I won't take a photo. You can give that to Rusty. And we, and we, can, say, uh, we can say, should we do a selfie? <laughs> Let's do a selfie. And it's Rusty's birthday today. Oh, it is? Oh, yes. We're going to sing you happy birthday. I don't know if he's watching, but... Oh, we better not sing it then. <laughs> well, happy birthday, Rusty. We're going to take a selfie for you. There we go. Congratulations, Rusty McGrath. That is um, an absolutely amazing nightscape image. Um, and I can say that it was a landslide winner. It, it was just, it got, every time I checked the votes, it was just vote after vote after vote after vote. All right, next one. Next one is for Lunar and Planetary. Comet Leonard. Comet Leonard, Steve Wilkins in the house. Come on up. I'm going to I'm going to give you the mic. Give you the other mic. And tell us a little bit about this image. Thank you, Mac. But what face but face this way, because yes. yeah. 
it's about uh, 40, 20 second uh, images. Uh, very lucky to be able to get it. I got over two nights. And uh, initially, the tail was quite yellow, but I recalibrated, not using Pix Insight, <laughs> AstroPixel <laughs> processor, and realized that the iron tail was actually a beautiful blue color. So great, and lots of help along the way from, uh, from members. Thank you. Congratulations. No Thank giant you. novelty check for you. <laughs> and we'll get a photo of you as well. Yeah, about there. Um, hang on. No, not. A, we don't want another selfie of me. And there we go. Yeah, comments coming. Comments about to crash into your head. You can you can catch that at the nearest bank. Whether you can find a bank at the universe, I don't know. <laughs> now, the next image actually has two novelty checks because not only did it win the deep sky, it got the most votes of all of the images combined. So it's the overall winner as well. And it's Mark Braithwaite's Dolphin Nebula. I don't know how you're going to carry both of these checks home. I'll hand those to you. So you got two of them. Thank you. You're all lucky. I'm rich at last. Yeah. <laughs> I'll hand the mic over to you as well, just to tell us a little bit about your image as well. Did you use PixInsight? No. I, oh. what, what is it? <laughs> is, is this on? Yeah. Uh, no, photo, Photoshop. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to say thank you to two, to two people, because I only started this hobby two years ago, and it's the first time I've entered something, so I'm, I'm very pleased, so thank you. Um, Andy Campbell got me started, and um, in the second uh, lockdown, um, I thought astrophotography sounds like a good hobby. And I found Andy's number online and called him and we were both doing nothing. And he convinced me to get going. Um, and then he taught me what to do to, to take the images. And then I need to unthank uh, Diego Colonello for convincing <laughs> me to spend so much money that I've lost one kidney and my wife wonders why we can't go on holiday anymore. Um, Hey, look, but, you've got two legs still, so yeah, yeah. there's more uh, equipment I, to I buy. Can't, I, I can't quite remember. I, I know I, I wrote it down for you, Mark, um, how many um, images this and how long uh, of exposure this was. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a guess now because I can't remember, but I think it's about 16 hours um, and a combination of um, exposures from uh, three minutes through to, um, through to 20 minutes. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, obviously um, HA and um, O3 and then RGB for the stars. Absolutely stunning image. Congratulations. Congratulations on being the um, inaugural winner of the CJ Murfield Awards. So I'll grab a photo of you as well. You don't have to hold them both up if you don't want to. There we go. Now, what I did forget to mention, because I got excited about the awards, is that the CJ Murfield Awards are named after our very first president, Charles Murfield. Um, so 100 years ago, he was named as the very first president of the ASV, and we thought that after 100, being 100 years old that we would honour him in being the first president by having the 100th anniversary awards, astrophotography members' awards, after him. So you can go now. You can run off. Yep. Um, we do have another award in that category but it hasn't been given out yet because we only got one submission and i'm and we can't give an award on one submission so we're going to reopen the scientific contribution one so that we can get some more some more submissions uh, and i know there are asv members who have done scientific papers uh, themselves and i'd love to see them submit it i really would um, so we'll get an email in Crux Extra talking about that particular award and we're going to extend it out and name that uh, name the winner of that one at our 100th anniversary dinner in on March 4th next year. So more, more to come on that one as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you for everyone online watching tonight. Thank you for joining us for another year of... Um, Astro Talks, it's been great to actually be able to get back in person and do these. Um, and we've had an uninterrupted year of them as well, uh, except for November when our speaker got COVID. Uh, so, 
at the last minute. Um, but it's been great to be able to present these. Um, I've loved doing it. Uh, the guests, I know the guests have loved giving these talks. We know you guys have enjoyed watching them. Um, and look, as I said, we've got one more stream next Friday night uh, for the drawing of the prize and for the uh, the Gazing at the Galaxies Christmas special, um, which will all be about uh, just galaxies, just looking at galaxies. We're going to try and get some that we haven't imaged live before for you guys. So come along and watch that. Kicks off at 9 p.m. because being summer, gets dark later. And hopefully, fingers crossed, there's no cloud and it looks like at this stage it's not going to be cloudy. Um, so once again, thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Congratulations to our winners. Thank you to our speakers tonight. And we'll see you next Friday night. Yeah.